that this is the only, only conflict which has registered in such a... Sh no, first of all, it's the only conflict, quote-unquote, which has registered such, an, such a death toll among UN staff. Over 130 mm. UN staff members have been killed. Around 100 journalists have been killed. Some by drones, meaning they've been followed and targeted. At the same time, no foreign journalists are allowed in. No Israeli journalists are allowed in. No one is to see what's happening in Gaza. So, again, I no, there is no precedent. This, extermin this is an extermination topic. Hello, everyone. I'm Rania Kalik, and this is Dispatches. U.S. officials respond to any and all criticism of Israeli atrocities against Palestinians with the same mantra. Israel has a right to defend itself. But does Israel really have a right to defend itself against people it occupies? What about Palestinians? Don't they have a right to defend themselves from their occupiers? Meanwhile, South Africa has invoked the Genocide Convention against the Israelis at the International Court of Justice, and the Israelis are freaking out. How serious is that case? What can be done to prevent a genocide that's being live streamed before the world? If the U.S. continues to shield Israel from all measures of accountability while blocking ceasefires and sending weapons every day, is there even any meaning to international law anymore? Here to discuss this and more is Francesca Albanese, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Occupied Palestinian Territories. But before we jump into it, this is just the first part of this episode. The full interview is available to Breakthrough News members only. You can become a member at patreon.com slash breakthrough news. And as always, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the bell so you get a notification whenever we post new content. And if you appreciate this show, you can also donate below on YouTube. Francesco, welcome to the show. Thank you, Rania. It's so good to have you on and there's so much I want to discuss with you. Um, I guess a good place to start, let's just jump right into it. Uh, you know, I think you know very well that American officials respond to any criticism of Israel's conduct in Gaza or when dealing with the Palestinians in general with this proclamation that Israel has a right to defend itself. And you've argued that in the case of the Palestinian territories, Israel, in fact, doesn't actually have a right to defend itself against the people it occupies. Can you explain what you mean by that? Yes. Um, I think that the statement Israel doesn't have the right to defend itself tells more than it means, in fact, because I speak on the ground of international law, where the right to defend itself doesn't necessarily correspond, uh, doesn't mean the right to protect itself, the right to protect its citizens, the right to protect its territory, which is sacrosanct and Israel has. However, in international law, the right of self-defense under Article 51 of the UN Charter means something else, more specific and deeper. It's the use of lethal force. It's the right to wage a war, which is only uh, uh, permissible under international law, either when it's authorized by the Security Council or in order to respond to an imminent attack. So people could say, yeah, but what Hamas did on the 7th of October was an attack. The point is that the context matters. The context that neither Israel nor uh, the US and other um, unconditional supporters of Israel do not want to pose and think of. The context is that of an occupation that has lasted 56 years and has translated into oppression and many violations of international law. So there is a consolidated jurisprudence of the International Court of Justice, the Supreme Organ of the, of the, um, the United Nations, which recognizes the threats, the security threat that emanates for Israel, against Israel from the occupied Palestinian territory, but at the same time it says, Israel cannot claim the right to self-defense in the sense cannot wage a war against the people it maintains under occupation. So Israel was allowed 
to use to respond to the attack but, and to use force, but it, it had to do within the limit of the law as an occupying power, which do not include the right to wage a war. Sorry, it was a long explanation, but I think it's necessary for people to get fully familiar with this very complex and, and sensitive meta. No, it's super important. And I also think it's I'm curious if you could elaborate a bit on the fact that not only does it not have this right that you're talking about to defend itself in the way that it's carrying that out, but it also actually has like an obligation to take care of the people it's occupying, which it's absolutely not doing. No. And the thing is that it was not doing that before the 7th of October. But think of it. Because this is the astonishing, shocking part of all this. For 56 years, without, without even going to what has happened before 1967, right? But since 1967, on the ground of security, security reasons, Israel maintains a military occupation, which implies the suspension of fundamental rights for the Palestinian people, including the right of self-determination over the Gaza Strip, which has also been held under blockade, which is a collective punishment for 16 years, during which Israel has waged five wars against the, against the Palestinians in Gaza, killing 4,000 people, including 1,000 children. And it has built over these 56 years, colonies after colonies after colonies, including during the peace process that started in the 90s. And it has, next, it has annexed Jerusalem as of the 1980s. These are crimes, building colonies, constitute a war crime, annexing a territory is so not permitted that is considered an aggression as the case of Ukraine and Russia reminds all of us. And uh, maintaining a, a population under blockade has been said, has been described by someone like uh, Luis Moreno Campo, the former, former prosecutor of the ICC, as genocidal itself. In the face of this illegality, what has the, commun the international community done? Nothing, nothing to fix this, this structural violence, which of course has uh, uh, triggered violence in response. And in any case, Look, I've condemned what happened on the 7th of October, and I will always do, and I say that those who have committed crimes against Israeli citizens by killing, brutalizing them, or taking hostages will have to pay. But this doesn't change the reality that the Palestinian people, as an oppressed people, have the right to exist, to determine themselves, and against continuous attacks at this basic right, of course they will resist. And this is recognized as legitimate within the limits of the law under international law. Well, that's what I want to ask you about next. When we talk about the Palestinians, it's never, I mean, you never hear Palestinians have a right to defend themselves, right? But do, I mean, as an occupied people, do they have a right to defend themselves and with weapons? There is a difference between the right to resist and the right to self-defense, because the right of self-defense can be invoked by a state. Now, the state of Palestine exists, uh, especially, but as uh, in theory, it's a state that lives under occupation, and it has never invoked the the right uh, the right to defend itself. Also, because it's not a full member of the United Nations, it's a it has an observer status. The question is that the occupation doesn't allow the right of self-determination of the Palestinian people to be fully enjoyed. So people whose right of self-determination is violated under international law have a right to resist. So there is a, um, in the 70s, during the phase of decolonization, armed resistance was recognized as legitimate. But we need to remind ourselves, and this is also recognized to the Palestinian people. Mm, there is a, a resolution, I think it's 3776, uh, of, the, of the United Nations, of the General Assembly, which recognizes the right to resist to the Palestinian people within the limits of the law. What does it mean that you cannot target civilians? You cannot target civilians ever. Civilians, I mean... Uh, have to be spared. There is the principle of distinction, proportionality, and precautions that apply, including to resistance movement. However, 
what we have to recognize is that not just what is the the status of the law, it's what's the perception of the people and how state project the right to resist today. We are no longer in the decolonization era where people were breaking the chains of their oppression. And again, it has never been, in no case it has been, decolonization has been a peaceful process. Mm. Now we are in the post 9-11. So even resistance movement are often uh, cramped into this uh, cauldron of terrorism. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, I keep on saying, I, I'm, I'm not entirely comfortable to say, oh, Hamas represents the Palestinian resistance, because I know the Palestinian resistance is much different. I mean, at least it has been much different in the past 20, 30 years, uh, with the exception of, of the Second Intifada, which was brutal and violent. But Palestinians have resisted peacefully and recurring to the uh, resorting to international law instruments like international criminal court, the international court of justice, uh, international treaty bodies, and they've never achieved anything. Um, so I don't want to dismiss the importance of Palestinian resistance also as peaceful. Mm. Um, at the same time, when there is armed resistance, armed resistance needs to comply with basic rules that I enunciated, uh, I mean, and I, I mentioned. And I'm also just curious, I mean, when it when it comes and this is just more of a broad question um, that obviously could apply to what's happening in Gaza. But if it when it comes to the issue of of genocide and the fact that, you know, there are people are charging that this is genocidal, what's taking place right now. Do those calculations change at all or does it remain under the same paradigm of like right to resist occupation, right to resist genocide? It sort of falls under the same thing or is that even in international law anywhere? I, I have no idea. <clears throat> it's a tough question. <laughs> uh, no, yeah, no, it's a, it's an interesting question, but Genocide is really the crime of all crimes. It's the most serious crime. And it's also the hardest to prove because it's not just you, know, you commit a crime and you commit a crime with an intent that is that that is evident. Like, for example, war crimes are violations of rules of international humanitarian law, uh, crimes committed in the context of hostilities. Then there are certain crimes that are so serious when they translate into an assault against an attack against the civilian population that can occur both in war and um, or they occur or outside of war as well, like forced displacement. Um, at the same time, genocide is really specific. It's the intent to destroy a people in full or in part through certain acts, like acts of killing, acts of killing member of the group, or acts of um, acts uh, intended to uh, to cause mass uh, suffering, mass um, uh, to cause harm, physical or mental harm, or creating conditions that would make life of the group impossible. Now, it's not necessarily, I mean, intent doesn't mean that you, you, you want each act uh, to produce a given effect, but it's the intent is the knowledge that that conduct can result into the destruction mm -hmm. of, of the people in full or in part. So I think it's absolutely commendable what uh, uh, South Africa did, instituting proceedings against Israel for genocide, the court will determine whether there is the risk and, the, and therefore a ceasefire is necessary, or, um, and then it will have to look into whether it is or it's not genocide. So Francesca, Israel's security establishment and their state attorney's office have expressed a concern that the International Court of Justice at The Hague will charge Israel with genocide in the Gaza Strip at the request of the South African uh, government. So I was actually a bit surprised to hear that the Israelis are so concerned about this. Can you explain the significance of South Africa invoking the Genocide Convention at the ICJ and how this could potentially have consequences on Israel's aggression in Gaza? Sure, surely. Um... There is a, a, a multiple layer significance of the, the South African institution of proceedings at the ICJ. The ICJ being the supreme organ of the United Nations 
has a special competence when it comes to genocide, which is, as I said, a crime of all crimes. Uh, and uh, there is a, an obligation uh, to prevent genocide in the convention. So when states do not act to prevent genocide, to stop genocide and the risk of genocide being committed, then the court can take, so it can declare mm, like some precautionary measures and South Africa has asked a number of, uh, of measures, but particularly a ceasefire. So, of course, uh, Israel is reasonably worried of uh, a request for a ceasefire because the, uh, the conclusions, the decision of the ICJ are obligatory and compulsory for all states. So it would be, it would kick off a series of reactions from the international community, which has been silent and inactive. But also, I would say the other layer of uh, complexity which generates preoccupation, it's symbolic. Having South Africa, former apartheid state, recognized apartheid state, acting against Israel, which is currently practicing apartheid, and charged, I mean, asking for measures against Israel for committing genocide, the state that it's considered is symbolically the state that emerges out of a genocide. The genocide of the Jewish people carries such a such a weight, also as a, again as a symbol that it's 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 huge. And therefore, um, now Israel is engaged in discrediting this uh, this measure from South Africa. But I'm very happy to see that as we speak. Many states are de declaring their intent, first of all, support for South Africa, commending South Africa, and declaring their intention to join the proceedings. I also saw a European state, Belgium, whose prime, vice prime minister said that this is an important move, and I hope that they will join the proceedings. This is very powerful. So what happens, let me, like, can you explain what happens if Israel wins? And then what happens if Israel loses? Like, what are the two outcomes here that could? But there are different. That, so what the what will what this South Africa's move has initiated is first of all um, um, a proceeding that might entail um, like some preliminary measures, some precautions, taking precautions because the risk of, there is a risk of genocide um, emanating from the measures used by Israel and the, uh, the numbers of, of victims. So there is the uh, means and methods of war, which, have, which already it's clear, clearly entail war crimes and potentially crimes against humanity, like starvation, extermination, and the threat of forced displacement. Um, so the threshold to take this preliminary measure, this measures, these precautions, is pretty low. Then there will be a full proceeding to investigate whether Israel has in fact committed genocide. And this is a much longer proceeding that will, uh, again, might last long because, for example, we have seen it in the case of Ukraine, in the, say, in the case of Myanmar, the proceedings were initiated, the court declared some preliminary measures, took preliminary measures, and uh, uh, and then uh, the proceedings take longer to examine uh, the, the, the commission of the crime. Okay. So then I want to ask you also, you mentioned earlier, it's very difficult to prove genocide, but you know, it seems like the Israeli leadership, many of the highest level officials in the Israeli government have stated on more than one occasion, what can be considered genocidal intent. I mean, that's what the South Africa uh, a case lays out pretty clearly. Uh, their soldiers are filming themselves on camera, very proudly committing really heinous crimes and enjoying it. Um, and, you know, I'm just curious, like how much more would, like how difficult is it to prove genocidal intent in this kind of situation? Is it actually easy? Does this come down more to the chances of whether or not this will be biased, given who gets to make the decision and given the fact that Israel is very good at pressuring and lobbying um, against anybody, you know, ruling in favor of, of Palestinians or in favor of a ceasefire in this case? 
It is difficult to prove genocide because you need to prove the intent to destroy a population in full or in part. At the same time, I do understand uh, what is behind your question in the sense that there are almost, I mean, according to some, there are 30,000 people who were killed. How many more need to be killed? The thing is that it could also be just war crime, the, the outcome of war crimes or crimes against humanity. But yet, there are, on the one hand, the genocidal, there is the genocidal incitement that and the South African government has been excellent, excellent at documenting these uh, the, the, the statements that do not come from, you know, uh, uh, just uh, uh, doctors. There were doctors calling for the destruction of Gaza, um, but there the, the, the were military commanders. There were... Um, Political leaders. There were. There was the 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 the, the president of Israel uh, talking of breaking their big backbone, like um, referring to all Gazans are all, all Palestinians in Gaza as responsible for what has, Hamas has done on the seventh of October. The question is, the question is, the, the, the intent to commit genocide is the knowledge of the effect that certain acts would have. Knowledge that certain conduct would cause the killing of the people, mass um, mass suffering, or creation of conditions in, which, which which will make life impossible, and it's undeniable that following these statements, the conduct was such that created conditions which will make life impossible. So there are there is the de deployment of genocidal technologies like causing starvation, destroying the, the health system that would allow the 50,000 people who have injured, there are three kids a day who get amputated of one or two legs. As we speak, 10 children are killed. No, I think more. I mean, the, the number of kids who get killed every day is astonishing. There are almost 10,000 kids who have been uh, killed. And this is an, an unavoidable effect of such a massive violation of the law of, of war. So uh, I think that it's, it's, it makes total sense to envisage genocide, but also for another element of Anya. A set, settler colonialism, if we look at settler colonialism, it carries an eliminatory element in itself. Ethnic cleansing, this is something that Palestinians have endured through and through since the very creation of the State of Israel, and in fact, since ever bef even before. And genocide mm. it, it, it is often an element of ethnic cleansing. So when the the, 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 the purpose of a state is to reduce the population, to, uh, to reduce it politically, uh, physically with forced displacement and, uh, and push them out of the land. And there are declarations. I mean, it, there, there are countless declarations that the Palestinians have to leave Gaza, have to leave um, uh, the, 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 the West Bank and East Jerusalem. There have been call for, calls for a Nakba, a second Nakba, in fact, it would be the third. So also in 1967, uh, 350,000 Palestinians were expelled from their land. So I say it's a continuum. So one is to appreciate what genocide would mean, what the crime of genocide would mean in the context of Israel's prolonged occupation and prolonged violations of Palestinians' rights. Yeah. And then, I mean, another element of all this, and this, I guess, falls more under the war crime category, but, you know, Israel's engaging in this systematic uh, destruction of medical facilities and essentially the eradication of healthcare infrastructure altogether in Gaza. And I'm just curious, as an expert in international law, does this have a precedent anywhere in terms of actively targeting as a matter of what seems like policy hospitals as military targets, like routinely, regularly across the board? Mm. 
There is no, it doesn't. Not, no. <laughs> not that we know. No. Not that we know of. And again, I oh. often talk to and work with uh, uh, experts of um, law or of our conflicts, experts in other conflicts. You know, I'm a human rights lawyer. My expertise is in human rights, also refugee law. And I would say I don't think so. And no one else I know can think of an of a, of a similar uh, experience, of a similar criminal conduct. But also, Rania, think that this is the only, only conflict which has registered in such a... No, first of all, it's the only conflict, quote unquote, which has registered such an such a death toll among UN staff. Over 130 mm. UN staff members have been killed. Around 100 journalists have been killed. Some by drones, meaning they've been followed and targeted. At the same time, no foreign journalists are allowed in. No Israeli journalists are allowed in. No one is to see what's happening in Gaza. So, again, I no, there is no precedent. This, extermi this is an extermination campaign from assessment. So it's, it's necessary to look at it. Does it constitute genocide? We need to give an answer. And... Those, the architects of this, the, those who have executed this, must be investigated and brought to justice. Yeah, you know, my uh, my I have friends in Lebanon who work for different UN agencies, um, and they're you know obviously very concerned about what they're seeing in Gaza, and on top of that, you know, they they fear that this conflict will expand to Lebanon, um, and. You know, the Israelis have the location of every U.N. facility uh, in Gaza. They also have the location. I mean, the U.N. gives them their location across Lebanon, and a lot of them don't feel comfortable with that. They feel like that's actually telling them where you can hit me if a war expands to Lebanon. I mean, that's the situation we're in. It it, it really is stunning it, 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 that this has taken place to the point where you mentioned 130 people, U.N. staff, have been murdered and you have the Israeli ambassador to the UN standing before the UN General Assembly a month or so ago, essentially accusing the UN of being uh, Hamas. I think he actually made a statement. I mean, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating when I say that. Many UNRWA workers in Gaza are themselves members of Hamas. The time has come to bust the myth of UN supplied facts. This council is being spoon fed lies. Um, as somebody who I works know. With the UN, I mean, how do you perceive that? Uh, look, this person in particular is notorious for his mm. incendiary statement, incendiary statements against UN officials, UN experts, uh, with a history of commitment to human rights and justice. Uh, he, I mean, the, what is um, what is astonishing to me is that his hubris is tolerated inside the UN. Um, his spurious allegations n are never met with proper measures because he insults the UN. And uh, he insults, frankly, he breach, is in breach of every standard of minimum decorum that should exist in the United Nations. Yeah. Well, I wanted to also bring up the issue of U.S. complicity. Um, I mean, Anthony Blinken, we're, we're recording this on a day when Anthony Blinken actually visited Israel. Uh, and, you know... Once again, the White House has stated that they are not interested in pursuing a ceasefire at the moment. The U.S. has repeatedly used its veto to prevent a ceasefire from taking place and used also its ability to pressure the U.N. Security Council against issuing a statement for a ceasefire. The U.S. sends weapons to Israel on a daily basis. Um, and, you know, they, they really do block all measures of accountability. So I'm curious, when we talk about 
the Israelis being investigated for, you know, what's an exterminationist campaign, all these war crimes, everything that we've discussed so far. Could the U.S. potentially be held liable for Israel's crimes? There is a case that was brought against uh, the U.S. Uh, by uh, a very renowned, very well-established organization in the U.S., which is the Center for Constitutional Rights, uh, against the U.S. for enabling genocide. So without prejudice uh, to the uh, conclusions of uh, of the court, I think it's very meaningful because, again, uh, sending weapons to a state which is clearly committing atrocity crimes and it's announcing overly <laughs> its intention to pursue yeah. further uh, atrocity crimes like the forced displacement of the, the people in Gaza out of, of Gaza. But, you know, think of this. Think of this. There are over 20 53,000 people who have been killed, probably 30,000, because there are 7,000 people who are missing and they've been missing for weeks. So they they perished under the rubble, reasonably. So out of 30,000 people, 70%, 70% of them were women and children. Uh, and Israel, so it means that 7,000, 7,000 are men, adult men, over between 18 and. Israel says that it has killed 8,000 terrorists. Look at the maths of this. So more than the male, so all the male population constituted a terrorist, a legitimate target, according to Israeli standards. Where's the evidence? We have seen... First of all, we have seen women hit, I mean, women targeted, women killed while waving a white flag and carrying their children, killed by Israeli snipers. And can we reasonably assume that more than the entire male population who has been killed were terrorists? You know, this is so, it, it, just, it just matters to pause for a second and do basic maths. Beyond the horror mm. of 70% of those who were killed being women and children, this assumption that every adult male is responsible, is presumed guilty, is precisely the, the symbol of the dehumanization of the Palestinians that Israel has, uh, has uh, put forward since the very beginning of this and in fact even before and then i'm also curious you know can you do you think you can separate what's happening in gaza from the west bank i mean obviously the scale of destruction and aggression in gaza is astronomically worse but obviously there's similar goals at play here um forced displacement ethnic cleansing you know, basically everything on a smaller scale in the West Bank is taking place. And I mean, I think over 250 people in the West Bank at this point, 250 Palestinians have been killed by the Israelis since October 7th. So I guess just to go back to my original question, can you separate what Israel does in these two territories? No. No, I cannot separate that. And I cannot separate what what is happening to the Palestinians in the in any part of the occupied Palestinian territory from what was happening before. Because the level of violence against the Palestinians, the level of oppression, humiliation, indignities as a result of uh, intentional violation of basic rights of the Palestinian people was a reality. So what we're seeing now is shocking, but not surprising. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear the rest, you can access it by becoming a Breakthrough News member at patreon.com slash breakthrough news.